All right, it's Saturday night, and uh, here we are at Colleen Finley Place. Last week you would have seen us uh, doing music worship here, um, but we're taking another step forward and recording um, a two-part series uh, coming from the parable series, but just a two-parter sermon um, starting today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David, and I'm the pastor at Northridge Church. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to bring to you the word tonight. Um, I'm going to come at this, it's really, it's one passage with two parables that really parallel each other, and I'm, I'm going to come at it from two different angles. That's why we're going to do it in two parts. So I hope that makes sense. Um, for those of you who are, are, are looking in your word, we're coming to you from Matthew chapter 9. Today we're going to begin in verse 14. And you might recognize these parables as the parables of the wineskin and the garment patch. So uh, you may have heard these parables before, and, and those are the parables we'll dig into. I'm going to read you the whole text today. I'm going to give you the context of the parable. But then we're going to approach each part of the parable from different angles. All right? So bear with me, let's uh, read Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Uh, my version of the Bible is the English Standard Version, ESV, and the subheading here says, A Question About Fasting. All right? So verse 14 says this, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can a wedding guests or can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. Now let's take a moment just to pray over today's message and next week's message. Um, just that the Lord would seal these words that we have for you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you um, humbly knowing that our words are flawed and, um, and they lack the perspective that you have. You are omniscient. That means you know everything. Uh, your word describes you as the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You've seen everything. You're omnipotent. You, you are, you are all-powerful. All of these things are true about you and not about me or any preacher. So we approach the word humbly, knowing that it is your word, though, and your word says that it won't return void. And so, Lord, we bring to you, uh, we bring the word today. We're going to share the word and expound on the word, uh, but pointing towards you as, as the giver of the word. We're thankful for it and pray you bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as you can see, again, today we're going to give you the context of both um, parables. And we're going to focus on the first of the two parts of the parables, okay? Um, actually, we're going to gloss over one part of a parable, and then we're going to look at the, the second parable, which is going to be our parable for the week. The, the story picks up with the disciples of John. They're the ones that actually come and ask the question. Uh, and, and you need to understand that there was a tension at this time, because John had quite a, a following, and people were attracted to him as a leader. Despite the fact that John kept pointing towards the one that would come, and then when Jesus came, he pointed to Jesus saying, this, this is the one I've been telling you about. But still, the disciples of John kind of had a different path than the disciples of Jesus. And it was these disciples of John who came to Jesus and asked him a very straight-up question. And they say, like, why do we... And why do the Pharisees fast, and yet you and your disciples don't? 
Now, again, many of you know who the Pharisees were, but uh, simply put, the Pharisees were the law followers. These people did everything the right way, which sounds good, except for they liked to let everybody know that they were doing everything the right way. So they followed the law to the letter of the law. They would be the ones where everything's black and white, and if you crossed over the line, they would hammer you as quickly as they could. They were all about preserving the law. They loved the law. And the law said that they were to fast, and so they would fast. And, and the question is really simple. It's like, why are we fasting, but you guys aren't fasting? And you know what? I've, I've wrestled with this. This could be perceived one of a couple of ways. This could be an innocent question. Like, well, should we be doing this? Is, this? is this something for us to do as well? But more likely, it was kind of a case where they're, they're scrutinizing Jesus a little bit. They're, they're kind of like, well, hang on. Why, why do we go through this? And, and just to be clear, they would fast me once, twice a week, go the entire 24-hour day without eating. And, and it, was, it was hard on them. Like, why are we doing this, but, but you and your disciples aren't doing it? Jesus had, I would say, a simple answer, but in a very convoluted way. The first part makes a lot of sense. He says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? It would make no sense if you go to a wedding and you start crying, just sobbing uncontrollably over the groom when the groom is right there at the wedding. It makes no sense. In the same way, Jesus is saying, yeah, you don't, don't fast and pray to, to some abstract idea of me when I'm right here. He says, just pray to me, come to me, talk to me. I want to have a relationship with you. So he's saying that, that there will be a time, actually he goes on to say it right after this, that the, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. This is foreshadowing for the time when Jesus is crucified on the cross and taken to heaven. Then it will be time to fast, is what Jesus said. But not now. He says, I'm with you. Don't waste a second uh, going through rituals such as fasting when I'm right here and you can talk to me face to face, man to man. This is where he goes into uh, another parable. And this is the first parable we're going to look at this week. In verse 16, it says this. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Uh, when I was growing up, I was a kid that grew up in the 70s, and I was still a kid in the 80s. Uh, I lived in a time where, uh, you've heard this before, where I would kind of say goodbye to mom and dad on a Saturday morning, hop on my bike, and I wouldn't see them. They wouldn't hear from me. I didn't pack a phone. I didn't check in until dinner time. That was kind of our, our, our time. And maybe if you're lucky, if you made some kind of arrangements, uh, the deal was as soon as, if, as long as you beat the streetlights. If the streetlights go on, you've been out for too long. So we would go out for the day, and, and we would play hard. I remember my poor parents. I went through shoes like they were, I don't know, socks. I would wear through shoes, but I would also, the, it wasn't fashion to have holes in the knees, but we would wear holes in the knees all the time. And in fact, it wasn't fashionable to have holes in the knees. And so what mom would do is, I remember she had these iron-on fabric kind of knee patches. You see like the university professors with their elbow patches, most of those are for fashion now, but these were patches in, in heavily worn areas. This was something we would do, is we would patch our clothes, because we didn't have money, just go out and get new ones, and it wasn't fashionable to have pants or jeans with, with uh, holes in them. So I have a, a pretty good idea of what this, this patch illustration means, but I, I think you can multiply that by a hundred. Back in the day, there was no store that you just kind of go out and buy yourself a new cloak or a new robe or whatever the fashion was in those days. If you had a tear in your fabric uh, of, your, of your clothing, this was like a, a treasured piece that you'd probably wear just about every day, and you would, you would repair it. And one of the ways they would repair it is with a, a patch. Now, what was true then is, is true today. Um, when we washed clothes, 
or when we wash clothes, there will be some shrinkage, which is a funny word to say on TV. Uh, I'm pretty happy that I didn't say it and then giggle right after. Uh, if any of you watched Seinfeld, you'll know what I mean. Anyways, uh, I, I remember back in the day, you never tried on your, your, your pants or you never knew they were the right fit until after you'd washed them once because they would shrink. Now, I don't know what they're doing today that makes it a little bit different. Maybe they pre-wash and whatever. But there would always be some shrinkage to the jeans after you washed them for the first time. So in the same way, he's saying, you, you don't put a, a new piece of fabric on a pair of pants or on a garment that has already shrunk because that fabric's gonna shrink. And when it does, it's gonna tear away at the, the old fabric that was there and you're gonna make things worse than they were before. You know what? He's pointing to something here. Again, Jesus always speaks in, in parables. Well, he doesn't always speak in parables, but he often speaks and teaches in parables with the purposes of, of creating this word picture that you can relate to so that you can understand what he's trying to teach a little better. All right? Let's take a second here. See, Jesus was saying two things here. And so it's appropriate that he uses two different illustrations. First, the garments, then the wineskins. Remember, he says this. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. The first point he's trying to make is that Jesus is not coming here to fit into the uh, disciples of John's idea or the Pharisees' idea of who he should be. He's not going to try and kind of fit himself into Judaism, what they, that, everything they've been studying. He doesn't want to fit into the box they have prepared for the Messiah. He is bringing something completely new. And he doesn't want to piecemeal it together. He doesn't want to patch this is not like a, a, an upgrade or what do you call them? An update on your app. This is not the Jesus update where, okay, now you're up to date. You've got everything. You, you were a little off track here, but now you're completely up to date. He's coming in to do something completely different. And so don't just try and take the Jesus patch over your old clothing. Because it's just not going to work. So this may seem short, uh, and I'm really excited, I kind of just want to go right into the next point. But I want you to chew on this idea. That when we travel from the Old Testament in time to the New Testament, this time that Jesus comes and lives amongst us and, and brings this new teaching, he's not just bringing this new layer, this new filter, this new update to God's word for us. He is bringing, he is something completely new, something completely different. And we, we need to kind of break free from the old molds of what we thought we knew and encounter Jesus fully. I, I feel like I'm kind of leaving you hanging here. And I'm super excited about how this news affects us next week. Uh, but all I can do is ask you to come back when we revisit this section of scripture and talk about the wineskins. So until then, be blessed and we'll see you next week.